committee will come to order. I would like to, I'd now like to recognize our second panel of witnesses. Mr. William Bouchard is Executive Director of Operations at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Mr. Stephen Burns is General Counsel for the NRC. Gentlemen, I know you have been sitting through the first panel, so pursuant to our, rec our, our rules, would you please rise to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear that, or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record indicate both answered in the affirmative and Mr. Bouchard, is that correct pronunciation? Yes, sir. One of my best friends is Bob Bouchard, of, uh, formerly of, of New York Recaton Company, so it is the only reason I didn't mess your name up. You are recognized for, uh, to give your opening statement. Oh, thank you very much, Chairman Issa. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Bill Borchard. I have served as the Executive Director for Operations at the NRC since May of 2008. I began my NRC career in 1983 after serving five years in the U.S. Submarine Force. As the Executive Director for Operations, I am the senior staff member responsible for the operational and administrative functions necessary for the day-to-day -day operations of the agency. This includes supervising and coordinating agency operational activities, policy proposal development, and implementation of Commission policy directives. Approximately 3,500 of the 4,000 staff members of the NRC report through the EDO. The staff of the NRC is fully committed to the agency's mission to protect public health and safety, as well as protection of the environment. This is a 24-7 responsibility. Accomplishment of this mission requires the dedicated and interdependent efforts of every employee. For more than 35 years, NRC experts have had a singular focus on our safety and security mission. We strive to be tough but fair and reliable regulators and to be an organization that continues to learn from experience. Learning from operating experience has frequently resulted in the imposition of new regulatory requirements and corresponding safety improvements at the facilities we regulate, as well as improvements to our own operations. The events at Fukushima are providing to us today a new opportunity to learn from operating experience and to improve our regulatory structure. Our safety and security mission has been and will always remain our top priority. In addition to a clear mission, I believe that any organization involved in nuclear safety, especially the safety regulator, must have a robust safety culture. The NRC staff safety culture embodies the principles of an open and collaborative work environment, the agency's principles of good regulation, which are independence, openness, efficiency, clarity, and reliability, and a commitment to live by a set of organizational values. And at the NRC, they are integrity, service, openness, commitment, cooperation, excellence, and respect. These principles are critically important to the success of our safety mission. They continue to guide our interactions within the staff and with our regulated community and with all other stakeholders. They are part of the staff's daily life at the NRC and promote mutual support, open communications, and a fully engaged staff. I believe an open and collaborative work environment encourages interdependence among the staff and promotes open discussion to help us make good decisions and provide the Commission with our best recommendations and to best serve the American public. The NRC has a long tradition of valuing diversity of ideas, different opinions, and questioning the status quo. In fact, we have a number of formal and informal programs that encourage the staff to raise differing views so that those views can be addressed in an open and transparent manner. We have demonstrated that differences of opinion within the staff can be addressed in a respectful and constructive manner. These differing views are frequently provided to the Commission for their consideration. It is through this open discussion that we most effectively execute our nuclear safety responsibilities. The staff is responsible for keeping the Commission completely and currently informed on all relevant matters. We accomplish this through a series uh, of formal and informal mechanisms, including memoranda to the Commission, Commission papers, status reports, and oral briefings. The Commission provides direction to the staff through budget decisions and staff memoranda. 
You are, have already been made aware of the results of the 2011 Office of Personnel Management Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. This survey measured employees' perceptions of whether and to what extent their organizations have the types of characteristics typically associated with high-performing successful organizations. The fact that the NRC ranked first in all four categories examined by the survey is a result of the collective efforts of the entire staff to adhere to the principles that I just mentioned. I am extremely proud of the skilled and conscientious staff with whom I work at the NRC. They have maintained their focus on our mission and the fundamentals essentially essential to doing an excellent job. It is because of our dedicated technical and administrative staff that we are the preeminent nuclear regulator in the world, and through our combined efforts, we strive to serve the American public in the best way we can. This concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Burns. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Cummings. I am pleased to be here before you today as the Committee examines the management structure of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. As General Counsel, I supervise a staff of approximately 110 uh, uh, people. My office reports to the full Commission and provides a full range of legal services, including counsel and representation, to both the Commission and to the offices that report to the Commission or NRC Chairman, and to the offices that report to Mr. Borcher, the Executive Director for Operations often referred to as the NRC staff. As general counsel, I am responsible for providing legal counsel to the chairman and the other commissioners, as well as the senior agency staff. I often intera interact with the chairman and with the other commissioners, and I strive to be fully responsive to the needs of all commissioners in carrying out these responsibilities. I have been a career employee with the NRC since 1978. I began my legal career as an attorney in what was then called the Office of the Executive Legal Director, where my initial duties primarily involved enforcement and oversight. I then served as a legal assistant and then executive assistant to uh, uh, Vice Admiral uh, retired Kenneth M. Carr, who was a commissioner and then later chairman of the agency from 1989 to 1991. Upon conclusion of Chairman Carr's ter uh, term, I became the Director of the Commission's Office of Appellate Adjudication, the office that drafts the Commission's adjudicatory orders. Subsequently, I served for more than a decade as the agency's Deputy General Counsel, where my responsibilities included overseeing legal representation of the staff in NRC administrative proceedings. In April 2009, former Chairman Klein initiated my appointment to serve as General Counsel. Uh, which was subsequently approved by the Commission. These diverse positions have given me substantial understanding of the legal framework governing Commission operations, particularly the Atomic Energy Act, the Energy Reorganization Act of 1974, and the Reorganization Plan No. 1 of 1980. The Energy Reorganization Act, of course, establishes the Commission and with respect to its members, provides that each shall have equal responsibility and authority in all decisions and actions of the Commission, shall have full access to information relating to the performance of the duties or responsibilities, and shall have one vote. The Chairman is granted particularly particular duties as the official spokesperson of the agency and as the principal executive officer with respect to the agency's executive and administrative functions, and as reflected in the Reorganization Plan. In carrying out these duties, the Energy Reorganization Act instructs the Chairman to see that the faithful execution of the policies and decisions of the Commission, and that he shall be governed by the general policies of the Commission and by such regulatory decisions, findings, and determinations as the, as the Commission may be law, by law be authorized to make. As I have advised the Commission, the NRC's enabling legislation reflects that the structure of the agency is framed around two core principles, the rule of the majority and the delegation of executive leadership to the chairman, which includes carrying out the Commission's policies. In providing legal advice and counsel to the Commission, I am ever mindful of these principles and believe they were intended to work in harmony to ensure the effective operation of the NRC. I would be pleased to answer any questions that the Committee may have. Uh, thank you, and I will recognize myself for five, the first round for five minutes. Mr. Borchard, uh, 
The uh, earlier testimony, I'm going to follow up on that quickly. Uh, have you ever been asked to withhold, limit, edit any information given to the other four commissioners that the chairman has? There have been uh, commission papers uh, and some budget proposal documents that have uh, been altered under the uh, chairman's direction. Yes, sir. Were those alterations uh, in detail made available so that the commissioners could understand that, or were they withheld? The uh, original staff proposal you are asking about? Yes, sir. Uh, eventually, I believe it was made available to the commission. Uh, eventually, doesn't quite get it. Were they initially denied? Uh, some of these documents were draft documents that the uh, Chairman's office uh, had uh, seen and uh, provided uh, direction on how the final document should be prepared. So, so, the, in, so the Chairman spoon fades the commissioners what he wants them to see. Is that a, a, maybe a little excess, but basically a direction? I, I would describe it as the Chairman uh, influences the information and the timing of the information uh, that is provided to the Commission on occasion. So he lied to us. He told us that he never did that. He told us they didn't withhold information, and he said they had full and complete, although he used some interesting words a couple of times, but I held him back, and you were both here, uh, to, to make sure that he said that. What you are telling me here today is that the commissioners, the four commissioners, do not have equal and unfettered access to the same information, even though they are asked to make decisions uh, based on the information they receive. Is that correct? I would say that the uh, Chairman influences the timing of the information that is provided. Oh, so he knows about it sooner and they know about it when he is ready for them to know about it? On occasion, yes. Okay. Is that open and collaborative? Is that consistent with the 3,500 people that you said fall under you and the way things work? Uh, it's it's not a practice we use within the staff, no, sir. Okay, and uh, there's been allegations of what, under the definition the, uh, 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 that the federal government uses, of intimidation and uh, what are the other harassment, intimidation, and uh, and a hostile environment existed at uh, the NRC, and in one or more cases has that been exhibited by the chairman? Yes, sir. But he doesn't have it. No, never mind. I won't go into it. He doesn't have anything to apologize. Mr. Burns, you've done a very good job in your opening statement of explaining that, uh, for whatever reason, Congress gave incredible authority to ignore the other four commissioners uh, to the chairman, right? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. What, the question that, that the powers, uh, the executive powers, are virtually everything. For the chairman, uh, you know, you, you basically—that's basically what you said in your opening statement. I don't think that is what I said. I said that there are two principles at play: the one principle, majority rules, and the other one that executive leadership has been focused through the reorganization plan in the chairman. Now, in doing that, the but executive leadership in a normal company is anything that the majority of the board thinks is wrong by the executive is, in fact, second-guessable by the board. In this case, you are saying that is not the case. I don't believe I said that at all. Well, but you are the legal definer. If three of the commissioners think the chairman is dead wrong in, in administration, executive, or other activities, in this case, four of them think he is wrong on many occasions, shouldn't that, in fact, be determinative of his behavior? Or are you saying that he has the authority to ignore them uh, in his dealing with ordering staff, you know, some 4,000 staff around? I am not, I'm not going to comment on the Chairman's behavior. No, no, no. I am not asking for the behavior. I am asking about authority. With respect to his authority, a majority of the Commission, particularly in, in policy matters, adjudications, and rulemaking, set the policy of the agency, and the Chairman is honor bound to, to carry that out. With respect to administrative matters, for the most part, administrative matters are delegated to the chairman. There are some specific examples or exceptions within the reorg plan. Appointments, okay. for example, Mr. Borchard's appointment and my appointment, he initiates, but the full commission uh, approves. Okay, so there is a few times which he has to go to his board. The rest of the time, he runs the show. That, and that is the contemplation under the reorganization plan. Okay. Uh, 
clearly today we were mostly talking about his management failures, at least relative to the, uh, the 4,000 staff members and the four commissioners. But one very quick question. I heard Mr. Tierney read verbatim the law that allowed this emergency powers. Was Japan under the regulation of this commission? No, and I don't think a, so. A, so you issued an opinion that everything he did was legal and within his jurisdiction, and I heard the verbatim. And now I'm a layperson, so I want to be told why I didn't understand. But I heard, I think, the complete phrase of authority, and we're talking about halfway around the world, a, a, a nuclear power plant and actually several reactors were in distress, and he asserted unilateral right to completely dismiss any participation by his commission, that power under the, what was read to us today, and I am not an expert on it, now you are, that power was limited to the 102 sites in the U.S. It, it, nowhere did it, it appear, and I guess some other sites, but it, nowhere did it appear to have anything to do with a foreign sovereign nation and their reactors, did it? The Mr. intent of that statute, that right. Mr. Chairman, the interpretation I gave to that statute and to those provisions in the reorg plan were not that the chairman was suddenly the nuclear regulator of the, of the country of Japan. What it had to do is, is that during the question I was asked, during the course of the ac accident, was when the emergency center was stood up and the chairman was in the op center and the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission was asked for information regarding uh, recommendations to protect U.S. citizens in Japan and U.S. servicemen through the ambassador and through the administration. He asked me with a question was, was it within his, within his purview to communicate that information? I gave him the opinion that, yes, it was. This was not an usurpation of all uh, the powers okay, of the and, and my time, my time has, has long expired. I wanted to just make clear that you gave him an opinion, so it is not him asserting some unilateral. But you are telling him that that's, that phrase, that is part of the, the law, gave him the authority to lock out his four commissioners. That wasn't the main reason today we were talking about management. So uh, it is important for me to understand that, because that action, which was not the focus of this hearing, uh, if there is a mistake, it is yours, not his. Yes, and there was no mistake on my part. Well, I think there was a big damn mistake. Well, but that's, I'm sorry, Mr. But that's Chairman, a separate, there was but that, a that is a judgment call, not a legal that's call. Right. No, and that's a judgment, legal judgment call. And my legal judgment, given the intention of the President of the United States in 1980 in issuing the plan and providing for the concentration under emergency circumstance of power into the Chairman, that the Chairman acted reasonably. I have had no Commissioner tell me I, that my view is wrong. I followed the opinion of my predecessor advising Chairman Reserve after 9-11 when there was not a particular threat to a U.S. power plant or facility. Thank you. Ranking members recognize. Thank you very much. May I have eight minutes, Mr. Chairman? Thank you very much. Um, following the Fukushima disaster, the NRC took a number of actions related to the emergency, including ensuring that two U.S. West Coast nuclear plants would remain safe from possible tsunami effects and standing up an emergency operations center at the NRC to monitor, monitor events as they unfolded in Japan. The operations center remained in monitoring mode to assist Japan and the multitude of U.S. citizens in that country and to deal with the ongoing emergency at the Fukushima plant. Mr. Burns, as the NRC general counsel, you wrote a memo on March 17, 20, 2011. And your memo concludes that the chairman had the legal authority under his emergency powers to issue the press release that provided the 50-mile protective guidance for United States residents and other uh, interests in Japan. In that memo, you said this, and I quote, the chairman's actions fit within his authorities under Section 3 of the reorganization plan under which all authorities vested in the commission pertaining to an emergency are transferred to the chairman. Mr. Burns, is that correct? That is correct. That is in my memorandum. And can you tell us simply how the chairman's actions were proper under current law? Yes. And 
Ranking Member Cummings, the other thing I would emphasize, it was not only, I think, a, a reasonable representation of the emergency powers, but as the official spokesperson of the agency, he had information that was developed by the staff and communicated that. So even if you disagree with respect to emergency powers, I, I think as a spokesman he could do that. The point I made, and I actually think you read uh, uh, the quote from uh, President Carter uh, during the testimony of the commissioners, is the, the purpose of, this, uh, of the plan in Section 3 was to focus the emergency response responsibility in a single person, the chairman. That was a finding coming out of the Three Mile Island accident. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I, I'm looking at that, and again, looking at the memo of my predecessor to Chairman Meserve, I felt, though it was a novel question, which I acknowledge in the memo, I thought that was a reasonable judgment. And you were using your legal judgment, your legal expertise, is that yes, correct? Sir. Yes, I was, sir. Uh, some have alleged that the chairman should not have used his emergency authorities to respond to the Fukushima crisis because the incident did not, and I think this is what Chairman Issa was going to, did not involve a U.S. nuclear facility or materials licensed or regulated by the Commission. But in your memo, you obviously disagree. You said that you do not view the language of the Reorganization Act of 1980 as, and I quote, I am quoting you, limiting the scope of the Chairman's emergency response authority only to incidents involving particularly, uh, particular NRC licensed facilities, end of quote. Is that right? That is correct. And uh, in your memo, you pointed to an opinion by former NRC general counsel following the attacks on 9-11. Here is what you said, and I quote, I note that the former general counsel, sir? Sir. Uh, sir, gave a similar opinion in the context of an agency response to 9-11-2001 terrorist attacks in determining that the absence of an actual event or damage to a nuclear facility or materials did not limit the chairman's authority to exercise his emergency powers. Mr. Burns, can you explain what that 2001 opinion said? and why it is useful for understanding how the chairman exercised his authorities during the Fukushima Shina, Shima crisis. Certainly. Uh, briefly stated, after, uh, after the 9-11 attacks, the NRC again stood up its emergency center, I think primarily in a monitoring mode or an enhanced monitoring mode. There was again no specific threat to a particular U.S. facility. The, it kept in that operation uh, for a few months. Uh, and the chairman, Meserve, at the time, uh, I think some of his commissioners wondered, well, how long is this going to go on? And I think he asked the general counsel, General Counsel Sear, to give an opinion. And her opinion, uh, again, she said, we understand what, you know, in terms of the text of the, in the reorg plans, but she said, looking at again at President Carter's transmittal statement and looking at the general uh, purpose is to focus the emerg emergency response responsibility in the single official, that that was a reasonable action on her part to do, uh, I mean, it was a reasonable action on the part of Chairman Meserve in the 9-11 context to do, and I adapted that. And again, I, you know, I concede it was a novel question. Now, Mr. Burns, this has been alleged that the Chairman, in violation of his statutory responsibilities, does not keep the uh, Commission properly informed. In your transcribed interview with the committee staff, however, you stated that the individual commissioners have a wide variety of ways to get information they need to do their jobs. For example, any commissioner can ask uh, agency staff for information, and each commissioner holds regular meetings with senior NRC staff. Now, is that correct? That is correct. In your interview, you said this, and I quote, the commission, the commission can ask for information within its functions, and it is not restricted to asking for the information that the Chairman thinks that the Commissioners ought to have. They can ask for anything within those functions. There is some balancing, again, about potential burdens and all that, but essentially that is a fairly powerful tool, end of quote. Is it fair to say that each Commissioner has tools at his or her disposal to, to keep, keep themselves informed? I think it is, and I think that is what both the Energy Reorganization Act and the Reorganization Plan provide. Could I make there is one footnote I would add to that, Mr. Cummings, and that is this. In, in matters involving the budget, the, the Chairman is responsible for budget presentation. 
and budget development. And so there's actually the, the view that we have is that in terms of the timing, uh, there, there is some influence in terms of the timing. It doesn't mean that the Commission can't get the information, but it is not real time because, again, the contemplation of the reorg plan is that the Chairman presents a budget. Once it is presented, then information is fair game to the Commissioner. Now, did you also say that, um, did you inform committee staff that during, during your transcribed interview that you were unaware of any instances in which the Chairman withheld information or failed to inform the Commission in breach of his statutory responsibilities? Yes, I am not aware of them. All right. Um, is it fair to say that each Commissioner, Mr. Burns, can you describe to the Committee what you believe the statute requires of the Chairman in terms of keeping the Commission informed? Um, I think in reorganization, the reorganization plan in Section 2, 2C or 2D talks about the Chairman's responsibility and the EDO through the Chairman, that, that it, it defines that, or outlines that responsibility. And with respect to that, uh, that can be implemented through the Commission's internal procedures in terms of information flow and the like. And, and as you described from, from my interview, is that Commissioners can ask staff for information. The last thing I would note is that the statute also provides, a, a, in effect, a safety valve, that if a, any employee or officer of the Commission believes that there is critical safety information or security information the Commission should be aware of, it can communicate with the Commission. And finally, do, do, you, do, do, do you believe that individual Commissioners have any obligation to seek out information they believe they need? Well, I think that each Commissioner has to decide for themselves what information they need in, in carrying out their responsibilities. And uh, I think just as a, a matter of their, their functioning, they, they have an obligation and I, I think an ability to do that. Thank the gentleman. I uh, yield myself five minutes for the purpose of questions. Uh, thank both of you for your service uh, at the NRC and, and your uh, testimony here today. Um, Mr. Borchardt, the um, issue of information sharing certainly is critical for the Commission doing its job well. The, if the Commission is going to take a vote that they all have the ability to make informed decisions and, and all have the same information. Um, in your uh, opinion, as uh, the senior staff member, um, do you feel that the staff feels comfortable sharing information? Because it has been made a point that all the commissioners have the right to ask for information. But uh, do the staff subordinate to you feel comfortable in sharing information with the other commissioners if it is contrary to a view they know that the chairman holds? Well, I think there's a, uh, there's been a longstanding practice that the staff is responsive to individual commissioners' requests for information through oral you know, conversations. Uh, that continues. There is a higher degree of apprehension, though, today under the current environment, as the first panel discussed, that right. uh, has, at least for me, a concern that there, there could possibly be some uh, reluctance to uh, provide uh, information as timely and as uh, candidly. And, and with that, uh, you reference uh, in response to a request for information. Uh, and I guess. Uh, if, if there is not a re request for information from a commissioner, but staff has information they think is relevant, do they feel like they, one, have to wait to be asked about it, um, and, are even, and even then are hesitant, or do they um, you know, feel free to share what they know, even if it has not been asked because it is relevant to something that is going to come before the commission? Well, I think uh, you know, it is informative to uh, separate these uh, discussions into two different types. There is an informal conversation. That, is, uh, that occurs between an individual commissioner and perhaps an individual office director that reports to me. That is a, a casual conversation w that it has a free flow of information uh, normally. Both parties would raise topics of interest. Uh, the other methods of communication are far more formal. Those are documents that are uh, typically signed out either by myself or by the office director to provide the status of an activity mm -hmm. or perhaps to raise a potential policy issue to the Commission. Those uh, discussions are much more fo formalized uh, into written correspondence. And in, in, in both, there is a, uh, a chilling uh, aspect today because of the current environment of, of the staff sharing information, whether it is informal or formal? Well, there is a change in practice, I think, that uh, goes to the uh, discussion from the earlier panel, and that is the historical practice, as I understood it through my 28 years at the NRC, is that if the, 
if the staff felt that there was information that was, uh, uh, would be of interest to the Commission, uh, that the uh, staff would fault to the side of providing that information in some kind of a written document so the Commission could decide whether or not it was of interest to them and whether or not they wanted to adopt it as a policy issue for their consideration. Uh, now what has happened more on occasion is that the Chairman's office has uh, made a, a decision as to the timing of when that information would go forward. So that was a, a fairly significant, from, from the staff's perspective, change in practice. And, uh, and clearly then an intent to control the information that is provided to the other commissioners. Or to uh, control, as the Chairman has described it in the past, control the agenda of the Commission so that he, uh, he could uh, monitor the, the Commission's activities. And by Commission, I mean the five commissioners right. that were at the first panel, not the staff, uh, technical staff's activities. And, and um, when you say monitor the Commission, uh, uh, do you think there is uh, a precedent for the Chairman of having the uh, appropriateness of monitoring the efforts of the other commissioners versus just setting the agenda? Well, I think perhaps my choice of words saying monitoring was not quite right. There, uh, what I meant to say is probably better to use your words, which was to set the agenda to have the Commission agree as to what topics would be raised when the Commission would issue directions to the staff on which topics. At any given time, we may have uh, uh, quite a few uh, documents and decisions before the Commission that we are waiting for guidance on. The, um, in your own capacity, um, have you been reprimanded or in any way uh, had action uh, taken against you by the Chairman for sharing information with other Commission members? Well, I would put myself in the same category as a number of the other senior managers uh, within the staff that have uh, you know, received uh, a, you know, a form of uh, verbal uh, direction and verbal counseling that, at least in my view, was uh, not consistent with the uh, NRC values that we uh, uh, endeavor to uh, perform our own behavior with. Right. The, um, and, and, um, and that was where your intent was to share what you thought was relevant information with other commissioners and the chairman took exception to that. Or, or, yes, I mean, that would be an example. Another would be just on the development of a staff uh, position, a recommendation that we would provide to the Commission. Uh, the, um, if in your role as senior staff, would you tolerate that type of conduct from a subordinate uh, of yours? No, and, and in my testimony, uh, that is the point I was trying to make, that the uh, organizational values that we endeavor to live by that I think are the reason the NRC has been such a uh, strong regulator and such a good place to work for our employees, uh, that that kind of behavior is inconsistent with uh, what we expect from the staff. Thank you again for your testimony. My time has expired. I yield to the Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I thank you both for being here today. Uh, as often happens with a second panel, people burn themselves on the first panel. Um, I would ask if both of you would be willing to take additional questions from members in writing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, without exception, that will be allowed for uh, Mr. Cummings. Uh, let's can we leave the record open for two weeks to allow members to put in questions and have them responded? Okay. Without objection, the record will be held for that purpose for two weeks. I thank you again for your testimony, and we stand. Uh, we stand adjourned on this hearing, and I would just announce that uh, we have votes imminent. So uh, immediately following this set of votes, we will begin the minority hearing. Thank you. We stand adjourned.